If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. The issue of unity and as the Lord Jesus Christ prays for it in John 17 is an important issue and one that I take seriously as a believer and uh, I feel the responsibility to pursue unity as the Lord Jesus Christ has prayed for it. Um, the Word of God encourages us to pursue and work at and endeavor at to keep that unity among God's people and therefore um, I must not uh, seek to be belligerent or uh, um, intransigent towards those who are truly Christ. But the issue with ECT is that it's calling us to what I consider to be a false unity, a unity that, that steps outside our understanding of, of what constitutes the faith of the gospel. And if you read the New Testament, especially Paul's letter to the Philippians, it was around that gospel that the New Testament church gathered. He calls them to have a one mind and one heart in their pursuit of the gospel. And therefore, that, that text shows us that, that uh, an understanding of the gospel is crucial to the issue of unity. And at that point, we have a problem with ECT because ECT redefines the gospel. In fact, it probably doesn't define the gospel at all. It, it immediately assumes that Protestants and Catholics are to accept each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, but it doesn't define the heart of the gospel, the doctrine of justification. What constitutes a man's sure standing of peace with God? And therefore, if we're to strive together with one heart and one mind, we must have a clear understanding of what the gospel is. And, and, and history shows us and theology shows us that evangelical Protestantism and Orthodox Roman Catholicism uh, are, are, are uh, at both ends of the spectrum there. One is a gospel of, of free grace. Another is a gospel of works and human merit. Uh, one is a gospel in which the finished work of Christ becomes the ground of our basis uh, of justification before God. And the other is founded upon the progressive nature of justifica justification in, ta in, in uh, tandem uh, with the unfinished work of Christ as we see it in the Roman Catholic Mass. So while I strive for unity with God's people, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is the gospel that becomes the basis of who I consider to be my brother and sister in Christ. Acts 2 tells us that, that the church met, they were of one accord. But what brought them together? It was the apostles' doctrine. And as they agreed upon the apostles' doctrine, they had fellowship together. And my fellowship and my relationship with God's people must be based upon apostolic doctrine and a clear articulation of the gospel. And what we have in ECT is a false unity. Um, I remember reading a story about a Persian ruler who, who tried to um, impress his guests at the royal palace where he would bring them down to a, a glass cage and in that cage would be found a lion and a lamb. And every stood, everybody stood back in amazement that a lion and a lamb could coexist together within the cage. And we, uh, when they asked the, the Persian ruler how he did it, he said, I do it by putting a fresh lamb in the cage every day. And what we have in, 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 in the ECT document is, is a unity that comes at a cost, and the cost is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I believe that our understanding of the gospel must be um, completely and solely rooted in God's Word. I mean, a couple of examples I hope that will support that. One would be uh, Paul's writing to Timothy, and how he reminds this young minister that from a child he knew the Scriptures, which were able to make him wise unto salvation. The writings of the Scriptures 
uh, was able to make Timothy wise uh, on the salvation. And we see clearly there that Timothy's understanding of Scripture, our understanding of salvation, didn't come from outside of Scripture, but within Scripture. We see in Paul writing to the Corinthians that um, the heart of the gospel is the death of Christ according to the Scripture and the resurrection of Christ on the third day according to the Scripture. And throughout the New Testament, we see this emphasis on the written Scripture. The gospel itself is the Scripture, the gospel according to Mark, the, Mar the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Luke and John, and then as it's developed and articulated within the epistles. So we see that our understanding of the gospel must be rooted in God's Word. Um, I mean, it is, it is able to make us wise unto salvation. Uh, back in the Old Testament, it, can, it, it, it makes wise the simple, and it converts the soul. And so the, the Word of God is the agency through which God uh, works salvation within the heart of man. It is the, the seed, as Peter says, that, that brings new life as it's sown in the heart by the work of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration comes through the revelation of God's Word believed on and applied to the heart. I think as Bible-believing Christians, we, we, when it comes to the issue of tradition, we must believe that there is a place for tradition. There's a biblical tradition. Paul tells the Thessalonians to hold to the traditions. But we must remember that tra the traditions of which Paul speaks is the gospel he had already articulated to the Thessalonians, that which they had already received. Remember he tells us in the opening of that letter how he preached the word in power, how they believed it, they turned for, uh, from idols to the true and living God. So there is a tradition that's biblical uh, and, and ought to be held on to. And within the context of the New Testament, it was a tradition already received. And we must not make the, the, the leap from a tradition already received and articulated in the New Testament to future aberrations of Catholic tradition that step outside the parameters of God's Word. So let me first of all say we, we believe there is a true tradition, but when it comes to church tradition, uh, as the Roman Catholic Church articulated a late set, we must, we must disregard that, we must, we must refute that. And I refute the Catholic understanding of tradition for, for a number of reasons. Roman, Roman Catholicism places uh, church tradition, the oral tradition supposedly handed down from the apostles through, through the successive uh, um, popes uh, within the Catholic Church, um, uh, and it must be revered equally as the written Word of God. I reject that for a number of reasons. Um, practically, um, we see within uh, Roman Catholic tradition so many doctrines that stand opposed to the Word of God, doctrines like the elevation of Mary, the universal authority of the Pope, the propitiatory nature of, of um, the Eucharist, uh, penance and the priest's ability and power uh, to forgive sin. These are not rooted in God's Word. They are rooted supposedly in church tradition, and we see immediately that there's, a, there's a, a conflict with Scripture. So the practical facts tell us that church tradition is not biblical tradition, in fact undermines biblical truth. Um, his, his, historically, we have a precedent for, for rejecting church tradition that comes up against biblical truth. The Pharisees did it. They overlaid God's Word with their own laws, with their own additions to, to revelation, and then they passed them on as truth coming from God and coming from Moses when they simply came from their own imagination and their own hearts. And we see Christ confronting that and saying how, how the traditions of man uh, are undermining the truth of God's Word. Uh, but, but biblically speaking, which I think ultimately is the more important point, um, I reject church tradition uh, because I do not see the necessity to supplement God's Word. According to Paul, all Scripture is inspired by God, and that Scripture, that God-breathed revelation as it was written down, that is sufficient, according to Paul, to thoroughly equip us unto every good work. So the very nature of, of biblical revelation uh, tells me that God's Word alone carries with it the stamp of inspiration. Um, the locus of God's revelation is the written Word. The Scripture is the Greek word graphi, which means that which is written down. Not oral, but that which is, is written down. So the very nature and work of inspiration tells me that God's revelation is located in what has been written down and what was given to the apostles in direct revelation. And then on top of that, the very activities and the attributes of God's Word show to me that they do not need to be supplemented or augmented by church tradition. The Word of God is able and sufficient 
with regard to, to growth and grace, with regards to salvation, with regards to cleansing the soul. Uh, the Word of God articulates in its own attributes its own sufficient ability uh, to see a man uh, brought to Christ uh, and brought through in growth in Christ. So the very activities and attributes of God's Word make that clear. In fact, it's interesting that the word that Paul uses to equip us was used in those days of a ship that was fully equipped to go to sea. It lacked nothing to be seaworthy. And that tells me that the written Scripture lacks nothing. It doesn't need to be augmented. There's not another pool of revelation or oral tradition that comes alongside it and ought to be treated equally. Um, we see the Lord Jesus Christ Himself um, and the apostles appeal to Scripture alone as the final arbiter of, of, of matters of faith and practice. Uh, we see the Word of God warn us not to step outside that which has been written not to add to the book of Deuteronomy, not to add to the book of Revelation. And, and we see this admonition not to add to that which has been, been written down. And it's interesting as you, you study the prophets and the apostles, that which was revealed to them was also uh, told to them to be written down. Moses wrote down the words of the Lord. Isaiah inscribed it on a cylinder his prophecy that was given by God. The apostles were told that inspiration is with regard to the, the writings, the graphi. And therefore, there is no uh, um, ground, it seems, within Scripture uh, to look outside of Scripture. And so, I argue from Scripture for Scripture, and, and I think it's very clear that um, church tradition, uh, as Rome articulates it, is unbiblical. And, and over, uh, over the course of history has undermined uh, the uniqueness of the Lord Jesus Christ and has undermined the wonderful gospel of free grace. And to that, to that end, I must uh, reject it. With regard to the issue of whether Catholics should be evangelized or left alone and recognized as brothers and sisters in Christ, as ECT seems to clearly infer, um, it is the bounden duty of the true believer and follower of Jesus Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, and uh, I think we have a responsibility to take the gospel to the Roman Catholic people that constitute almost a billion of this world's population. And the reason I do that is because I believe that the Roman Catholic is devoid of, of, of a true understanding of the New Testament gospel. They have a fear for God, and, and, and sometimes uh, in my own mind I liken them to, to Paul's description of, of his fellow Jews, that they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge, going about establishing their own righteousness. And the gospel of the Roman Catholic Church is a gospel that, that teaches that a man through infused grace in cooperation with that, the work of God in the heart uh, um, sews together uh, the fabric and the robe of his own self, uh, righteousness. And, and uh, the Word of God is very clear that um, the righteousness that we need is a righteousness that alone comes from God. It's free because it, it comes on the basis of grace, and it's been purchased by us by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I look at the Roman Catholic understanding of the gospel, justification is an unfinished work. Works contribute uh, to one's standing towards God, and yet Paul says, for by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In fact, he says in Romans, if, it's, if, if works contribute to it, then it's not of grace because those two concepts are antithetical. And the Roman Catholic who's working and cooperating uh, with this infused grace to the end that he might be justified before God needs to hear the wonderful message of the finished work of Christ and the free gift of an alien righteousness that comes from Christ to us and is received by faith as taught by Paul. Therefore, being justified by faith alone we have peace with God. That's the gospel of the Protestant Reformation. That's the gospel of the Evangelical Church. It is not the gospel of the Roman Catholic Church. And therefore, evangelism is appropriate, necessary, and, and we must set ourselves about the task of winning our friends and our loved ones and our Catholic neighbors uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems to me that um, the Roman Catholic understanding of grace um, is contradictory in, in the sense that on, from one side of the mouth they speak about grace being a gift, but from the other side of the mouth they speak about grace producing meritorious works. And those two concepts are uh, antithetical. You can't talk about grace and cannot talk about works. 
And Paul says in Romans that if it's of grace, then there's no works to be, to be uh, contributed. If it's of works, then, then grace um, uh, leaves. Uh, it won't stay in the presence of that which, which is supposed to be worked for. Uh, it seems to me that, that um, grace in, in the Roman Catholic mind is, is a gift to be achieved, which is a contradiction in itself. And also that grace in the Roman Catholic uh, Church's understanding is, is mediated through sacraments and through the church rather than directly uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, my understanding of grace according to the New Testament is that grace is the un, undeserved and unmerited favor of God. And it's located in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. For grace, according to Paul, has appeared uh, in the person of Jesus Christ, bringing salvation to all men. And, and uh, that grace is free, and that grace is unmerited, and that grace must be received, uh, not achieved, and, and I think that's, that's the critical difference. And also that grace is received directly as the repentant sinner who repents and has faith toward God through Christ receives that grace. He doesn't need to go through um, uh, the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I, I think that's the main difference. I think uh, when it comes to the Roman Catholic Church's portrait of Mary, uh, they uh, paint that portrait from, from an altogether different palette than we do. Because it seems if you look at a Roman Catholic's portrait of, of the biblical Mary, that she's been overlaid uh, with all sorts of touch-ups. Um, if you look at uh, the Roman Catholic understanding of Mary, uh, it begins with her being conceived immaculately. Um, uh, that means that, that uh, while she was the product of a human mother and a human father, uh, at, at the point of conception, uh, the Lord, in, in according to the Catholic Church, in an act of grace, uh, prevented her being tainted by original sin. And so according to Rome, Mary was born without sin, Mary lived without sin, Mary did no sin. And, and to cap that all off, uh, Mary was, was uh, bodily um, assumed into heaven and did not see the decay of, of, of uh, death because that would be the result of sin. And she, she herself, according to Rome, had never been tainted by that sin. Uh, and then uh, after her assumption, according to the Roman Catholic Church, uh, she has been crowned the Queen of Heaven. Uh, she sits by the side of her regal son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and acts as a go-between between between the mediator. That's the contradiction of, of Mariology. She becomes a go-between between between the mediator. Uh, she's, she's the neck uh, between the body and the head. And if we want to get to the head, Jesus Christ, we go through the neck, and Mary's that neck. And if Christ wants to mediate His grace and, and bless His people, then He will mediate it through His Son. And we see that uh, that's clearly articulated in Catholic theology, that, that Mary has become a co-mediatrix and a co-redemptrix with, with her son. And I find that so abhorrent uh, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, seems like uh, an angry son that needs to be talked around uh, by his mother. Uh, because the Word of God is very clear that we can come as repentant sinners and as needy people before God. We go directly to the throne of grace. And there we find a willing Savior, not a reluctant Savior, but a willing Savior uh, who, who wants to immediately mediate to us um, grace for, uh, and help in our time of need, mercy for our sin, and, and strength for our struggles. And so it's clear that, that the, the Catholic Church has taken a biblical portrait of, Christ, of, of Mary, added to it, and, and, and defaced it. And um, as biblical believers, we must, must uh, get back uh, to the portrait of, of a, a godly woman who submitted herself uh, to the will of God for her life. She's a wonderful model uh, for both women and men in terms of godliness, submission to God's Word, submission to God's will, and, and, and uh, a love uh, for God's Son, uh, her Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The country into which I was born in Northern Ireland is actually predominantly Protestant with, with um, a, a Catholic uh, population within the minority, but Ireland taken as a whole um, is largely Roman Catholic. The Republic of Ireland is 98% Roman Catholic. And uh, my experience, I mean, I have my theological issues with Rome, but my own experience supports my, my controversy with the Roman Catholic Church. When I came to know Jesus Christ as a young man at 16, 
in, in uh, Belfast within Northern Ireland. I, I uh, within four months, found myself on an evangelistic team uh, going to a town in the center of Ireland, beautiful little village called, our town actually called Athlone. And we worked out of that town uh, through the Baptist church there. And it, it was very clear to me uh, then and still is today that the Roman Catholic people we met and, and, and shared the gospel with both at the, both at the street corner or on the doorstep of their homes had no clear understanding of the gospel. They had no settled peace with God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, they, had, they had no um, peace uh, through the blood of Jesus' cross. Uh, and, and it was very clear that they were a people uh, without um, the gospel and a, and a people without the hope uh, and certainty uh, of the, the free offer of God's grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and my experience has been with the, with the Roman Catholic people of Ireland is that uh, unlike uh, ECT uh, tries to make out that they do not have an understanding of the gospel at all. And actually, when God begins to open the heart, they have a tremendous hunger to hear the true gospel. They want to leave the uncertainty of a justification that never seems to be finished and will ultimately be only finished in purgatory. To hear a gospel that says that if, 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 if belief is put in the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work, uh, and, 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 and the glory of that is attributed to the grace of God alone, that peace can be found now, uncertainty can be found now, that, that John is right when he says these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. They long to hear that, and I want to share them with that. And my experience has been that they're hungry for the gospel, and also that the Roman Catholic Church stands in the way of the clear presentation of the gospel. Um, it, it, many of my friends back in Ireland give testimony after testimony of how as they start to make inroads into the Catholic community, the Roman Catholic priest or the Roman Catholic bishop within that locality immediately steps in and thwarts or stops or hinders any, any reaching or bridging of the Roman Catholic community with the evangelical gospel. A friend of mine just recently uh, um, found many doors to him closed within the, the county of Donegal. He worked with CEF, was getting into many of the schools, uh, sharing the New Testament uh, with the children. And as he built up relationships with those children, he naturally shared the gospel. He didn't go in, in uh, to, to offend. He didn't go in uh, uh, um, against the will of the schools or the Catholic community. But once those children began to show an interest in what he was sharing, in the simple, uncomplicated gospel of, of God's grace manifested in Jesus Christ's finished work, immediately the parents were told by the priests to pull their children back. So my experience in Ireland has been uh, that the Catholic Church is no friend of the gospel. And I think the evangelical church in America needs to waken up to that. Um, I remember many years ago uh, a friend sharing with me that when the Roman Catholic Church is in the minority, uh, that it's as, sly as a, a gentle as a lamb, when it's in equality, it's as, it's as sly as a fox. And when it's in the majority, it's as ferocious as a tiger. And if you go to Europe and find the Roman Catholic Church in the majority, as it is in Ireland, um, evangelicals are not given much space, and they're not treated as brothers and sisters in Christ. I think it's with, with complete shock and surprise that we as evangelicals should, should consider uh, the document ECT, because it definitely is the dawning of a new day to see evangelical Protestants sitting down with Roman Catholics who, who sign up to the councils of Trent and, and the dogmas of Vatican I and II and the New Catechism and say that there is, there is a, a, a spiritual camaraderie to be sought and, and to, to be pursued. And, and I think to see that happening is, is, a, is a surprise, um, much like the surprise of Paul with regards to the Galatians, that they would desert the gospel for a false gospel. And, and as I've thought about that and tried to, to, to figure that out in my mind, a couple of things uh, within my pastoral experience and just my theological understanding of where the trends are, that the evangelicals are susceptible to this, this um, compromise with the Roman Catholic Church because evangelicals no longer know their own heritage, theologically speaking. Uh, the average evangelical cannot himself define the doctrine of justification, wh what the principle of sola scriptura is. And yet we see in the New Testament that the whole tenor and thrust of the evangelical 
uh, New Testament church was an understanding of truth, an understanding of what the gospel was, an understanding of what constituted the component parts of, of what truly represents the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, theology used to be called the queen of sciences, and it seems within the evangelical community that that crown has fallen uh, from the head of that queen. And I think that's why we're seeing this, 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 this trend, that we, we no longer know our own theology, and therefore we cannot compare um, uh, apples with oranges, because we don't have that theological framework within which to make those discerning judgments. And there even is, is a, a, an unwillingness to be discerning. In an age of toleration, evangelicals are becoming susceptible to, to, the, to the philosophy that says, uh, live and let live. And yet the Word of God tells us in, in Thessalonians that we've got to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good and reject that which is evil. And the word to approve there means to test. It was, it was used in the context of the New Testament times to test uh, um, coins to see whether they were of a true mint or a forgery. And we have a responsibility as evangelicals to test the spirits, to be doctrinally discerning. And if it means weighing up one uh, uh, religion against another, one, one set of beliefs against another, we must do that. And yet ECT itself war encourages us not to do that. I mean, beyond the lack of doctrine and, and theological awareness within the evangelical church that leaves it so susceptible uh, to compromise, theologically speaking, as we see with, with the ECT and, and, and uh, the equation of, of the Roman Catholic understanding with the, with the Protestant understanding of the gospel, we, we also have a lack of discernment. Uh, we live in a day of, of tolerance, a day of, of uh, pluralism. And, and uh, if the evangelical community is not careful, they're in danger of, of imbibing the, the live and let live mentality of our day. Um, that one, one belief is, is as good as another. And uh, that is certainly not the case. The New Testament gospel is an exclusive gospel. It's founded upon the unique person of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore, uh, the Christian gospel is not inclusive, it's exclusive, and that would lead the New Testament Christian to be discerning. And Paul tells uh, the Thessalonians to be discerning, to approve that which is good and to reject that which is evil. The word approve, there's an interesting one, it's used in the context of the New Testament times for, for um, the approval of, of a coin that was of a true mint over and against the counterfeit, uh, the forgery. And, and Paul is saying, be careful. There is fraudulent doctrine abroad. There is, there is counterfeit theology and counterfeit gospels abroad. And I want you to be a discerning people. And, and we see um, discernment also in, in the, the letters of, of uh, John, where he tells the believers to test the spirits. We see the church at Ephesus commended by the Lord Jesus Christ that they just wouldn't even accept someone who came with apostolic credential. Uh, they would be tested, they would be, they would be looked at. And I think we're losing that within the evangelical church. Um, we certainly don't, don't want to come across as, as um, unfriendly uh, and, and belligerent people. But the New Testament believer has a responsibility to, to uh, police and to scrutinize uh, that which, which um, passes itself uh, as truth. And the Word of God itself shows that there that, that the believer ought to be antithetical. I mean, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, the, the believer must, must choose between, between light and darkness, between God and Baal. And so uh, the evangelical church is running from that, and ECT encourages us to run from that discipline of discernment uh, because it tells us that there, it's unchristian to weigh up the strengths and the weaknesses of one, one community against another community, one religion against another religion, but um, uh, that's not true biblically. Uh, one, one other thing concerns me a little with, with where evangelicalism is going, especially with regard to ECT. The whole thing is couched within the context of the meltdown of, of morals and virtues within we, uh, um, the Western society. Uh, how today's uh, society is, is breaking uh, from, from the anchorage of a Judeo-Christian ethic uh, under, underlying social behavior. And while that concerns me and ought to concern each and every one of us, um, 
that concern for, for the proponents of ECT takes them in a direction I'm not wanting to go. What do I mean? Well, the, the ECT is, is, is being promoted because they want a broad alliance of, 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 of um, anything uh, that, that bears the name Christian, anything that, that will advocate a Judeo-Christian uh, value system. And, and so uh, theology and differences are set aside as we pursue what is clearly a, a, a social and political agenda uh, to turn a society back uh, in the direction of God. Uh, J.I. Packer, uh, even in the book, uh, Defending Evangelicals and Catholics Together, talks about the re-Christianizing of North America. And my problem with that is that the Christian church is not called to re-Christianize anything. We're called to evangelize. We're called to win lost people to Jesus Christ, see them baptized and discipled and grow in grace and in, in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And what we have in, 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 in uh, the re-Christianizing of a country is simply making uh, pagans more moral and lost people outwardly more clean. But, but the darkness and the death that, that resides within their hearts, spiritually speaking, has not been touched. And, and I would encourage evangelicals in America, while the, we ought to pursue um, involvement in the public square and in politics, because, because a moral righteousness exalts a nation and is beneficial to the peace and the well-being of a society. That is not the great commission that the Lord has given to us. And if we begin to lose the moral ground in America, the church will still exist. The gospel will still take root in, in the hearts of men and women as God, the Holy Spirit, uh, turns the sinner towards Jesus Christ. And so let's be careful not to, to um, mistake the saving of a soul with the saving of a nation. And I think ECT makes that mistake. It's a critical mistake and it's a dangerous mistake. The church's agenda is not a political one or a social one. It's an evangelical one where we take the gospel of Jesus Christ to a society, whatever state we find it in, and we preach that liberating gospel to, to men and women and we disciple them in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our call. And, and I think we're losing our bearings in the ECT document. So if you put those issues together, I think we've become susceptible to this compromise because there's a lack of doctrine and there's a lack of discernment within the evangelical church and there's a lack of dependence upon God as, as we kind of scamper for, for these alliances with, 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 with religious bodies that our forefathers believed were unsound and therefore unhealthy for the body of Christ. We've been speaking about whether the, the Roman Catholic Church is a Christian church. And I think that the answer to that question is that a church, if it's to be considered a church, must possess the true gospel. And I think uh, the Roman Catholic Church is devoid of the true gospel. And J.C. Ryle, a former bishop of Liverpool in England of a former generation, I think gets to the kernel and the heart of this matter when he says this. Take away the gospel from a church and that church is not worth preserving. A well without water, a scabbard without a sword, a steam engine without a fire, a ship without a compass and rudder, a watch without a mainspring, a stuffed carcass without life. All these things are useless things but there is nothing so useless as a church without the gospel. And the Roman Catholic Church is a church without the gospel. And therefore, it serves no purpose for us to align ourselves or to have an alliance as e ECT would ask us to have. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the gifted and gallant 19th century ba Baptist preacher, epitomized the spirit of protest and theological stance which we've been speaking about. Listen to his words. It is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. If it be not the popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name because it wounds Christ, because it robs Christ of His glory, because it pours sacramental efficacy in the place of His atonement and lifts a piece of bread in the place of the Savior. 
and a few drops of water in the place of the Holy Ghost, and puts a fallible man like ourselves up as the vicar of Christ on earth, if we pray against it, because it is against him, we shall love the persons, though we hate their errors. We shall love their souls, though we loathe and detest their dogmas. And so the breath of our prayers will be sweetened, because we turn our faces towards Christ when we pray. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels with just a quick message to our viewers to check out our main YouTube channel, C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, where we have all of our over 610 videos posted. By going there, you can see all of our videos organized by playlist, categorized by subjects. Once you scroll down past our Bible prophecy trailer at the top of the channel page, the playlist begin. You'll see our recent uploads playlist, followed by our most popular videos playlist, followed by our playlist on Jehovah's Witnesses, then Islam, the Muslim religion, then Roman Catholicism, Darwin's metaphysical evolution religion, Seventh-day Adventism, dealing with anti-Trinitarians and early church history, our multiple playlists, which includes God-hating atheists, Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyists, Dealing with UFOs, Ghosts, Spiritual Warfare. Our radio shows with national Christian authors and our music bids. The Black Muslims, Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. Mormonism, Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, Antichrist, Cults, New Age and World Religions. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, and Spanish videos, end times, supernatural prophecies, and tough Bible questions, and our playlist dealing with predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism. Our YouTube channel is built to help people learn the Bible and defend their Christian faith against false prophets that come against it from every side, Jude verses 3 and 4. At the time of this recording, our channel has already been blessed with over 6 million viewings and over 10,000 subscribers. <laughs>